In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Amen. I like to say that's one way of evangelizing the neighbors. I'd like to start by saying Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. It may be a greeting card holiday, I'm not sure, but our mothers are worth acknowledging, that's for sure. Um, we should be thankful for them because we wouldn't be here without them. And so uh, I just wanted to first acknowledge that uh, it is Mother's Day. And thank all of the mothers, all of those who have sacrificed so much in order to give us this life that we have. I, early on in my journey toward orthodoxy, I came to the realization, the very humble realization, that we don't have life apart from being given it. And you know, we desire to live and we desire to live well. Why? Because God brought us into being as a result of something very beautiful, the participation of man and woman in the creative life that God has given us. And through two people coming together, the miracle of a unique and unrepeatable being, a person created in the very image of God takes place. And then something very, very precious that many of us men will never understand happens in that a mother carrying a child in her womb experiences such an intimacy, such a love and such a closeness with her child. The child is utterly dependent on her and she carries, physically carries that child, feels that child. Again, I, in a way that I will not ever understand, but I've begun to really humbly respect motherhood in a way that I never did before. And especially through reflecting on the life of the Theotokos, reflecting on motherhood caused me to realize how significant and unique her relationship with Christ is. How unique a love that she has for her son and how unique a relationship he has with her. And she's the mother of all Christians because she's the mother of Christ. And as we like to say, she's the very first Christian. And so someone actually lovingly, as is appropriate, brought a bouquet of flowers to place in front of her icon today. You may notice every once in a while flowers show up in front of that icon. Well, that's because people who love the mother of God bring her flowers sometimes. And they place them up here. And it's appropriate to do that on Mother's Day. I just wanted to thank all of you mothers and acknowledge what a great sacrifice you make in bearing your children. And then even when they're outside of you, I, I know even once they're born, I know you carry them with you. You cannot separate yourself from them. And that's why you feel their pain so uniquely and love them so much. So thank you. And I want to thank, I don't think my mom listens to my homilies, but I want to thank my mom even for bringing me into this world. Now for today's homily. Today, beloved in Christ, we find ourselves on this, at the second Sunday after Pascha, on which we remember St. Joseph of Arimathea, the righteous Nicodemus, and the myrrh-bearing women. Generally, this is referred to as the Sunday of the myrrh-bearing women. Last week, on Thomas Sunday, we saw how belief was proven by unbelief. How the reality of the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ was was borne witness to by the touching of the risen Savior's body by Thomas, reaching into his side. And we heard in the hymn so many beautiful things like, how can grass touch fire and not be withered up and burned, decimated? The answer is always because God loves us. He let the grass that is the, hum the human person of Thomas in his doubt God, who is realer than any real, any realness that you and I can perceive. He allowed the questioning Thomas to reach in and touch his side. And then Christ received worship and he did not correct Thomas, who cried out, My Lord and my God. 
And Thomas proved himself in that moment to be a truth teller. And as I like to say, stealing the words of one of the fathers of the church, a superb theologian, crying out and calling Christ, my Lord and my God. Today, having already borne witness to the resurrection, the, cause, the church causes us to look back. You heard it in the gospel reading. We went back and revisited some of the things that we have already experienced during Holy Week. And on Pascha, we look back to Joseph and Nicodemus and the myrrh bearers with a kind of retrospect. One significant demonstration we see from them is all of them had a respect for the body of the departed Lord. I became, become convinced that mercy for the departed is among the greatest mercies. Who will remember those who have departed this world with all their failures, their unfulfilled hopes, and now unable to provide any recompense? To show mercy to the departed is an utterly selfless act and an act of love. And that's why we in the church, we pray for those who have departed this life before us. And also that's why we don't, um, we don't cremate in the church either. We don't destroy the body that has been and is the, the very image of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit. The body doesn't cease to be that which is created in the image of God when the soul unnaturally departs from it at the point of death. So we don't destroy the body after the point of death. Just like they did not destroy the body of Jesus after he was crucified and brought down from the cross, put in the tomb. He was put in the tomb as dead. And what did they go to do? They went to honor his body. Just like we venerate, like kissing an icon. It is kissing an icon. Just like we venerate the body of those who have departed from us when we have the funeral service in the church. And in the case of Joseph and the myrrh bearers who took care of that precious body of Jesus, not only was it a selfless act, but it was a risky one as well. We hear of Joseph that he took courage and went to Pilate. Pilate, the one who had, who had the Savior's death accomplished, the one who had dealt with such grief over a man he didn't want to deal with. Pilate, who had washed his hands of responsibility for Jesus' death, I'm sure that he would have been happy to move forward, never hearing that name again. And now he's approached again by someone who wants the body of this crucified one. Get him out of my head, this one who had caused him such grief. Perhaps Pilate should have flogged him for even mentioning that name again. Or what of the ones who so desperately coaxed Pilate to send Jesus to, the de to death? What if they got wind of Joseph's interest in Jesus? You know, it's, it's said that Joseph, Joseph was a secret Christian. At least they would try to marginalize him. Mock him for having anything to do with that liar and blasphemer, Jesus. Yet as if without a thought about what consequences it might bring. This man showed his true nobility. He besought the Lord's body, anointing it with spices and placing it in a new tomb. A rare honor for someone who had been given such a shameful exit to this earthly life. St. John Chrysostom wrote of St. Joseph of Arimathea. He says, this was Joseph who had been concealing his discipleship. Now he became very bold after the death of Christ, for neither was he an obscure person or unnoticed. He was one of the council and highly distinguished, and as we see, courageous. For he exposed himself to death, taking upon himself the enmity of all by his affection to Jesus. He begged for the body and did not cease until he obtained it. Not only that, but by laying it in his own new tomb, he actively 
demonstrated his love and courage. And we see the courage of the myrrh bearers today, the women disciples of the Lord who were seemingly fearless. Surely they knew the tomb had been sealed, yet they insisted on visiting the body of our departed Lord. Keep in mind this all, all, the, all while the others were hidden in isolation. They were hidden for fear of persecution. All of the other disciples. These were the ones, these women, who never left the Savior's side, neither in life nor in death. Moving about as those free from worldly concern and fixed on Christ. And as a result, they became, what we say, the apostles to the apostles. What a precious name or title given to the myrrh-bearing women. Expectations had been shattered. Jesus' followers were confused and in fear. But these ones, to quote St. Paul, against hope, they believed in hope. And while others had scattered, they took courage and drew near even to the body of Him, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In looking back upon these ones, we find an incredible example of hope and courage and integrity and were to be inspired by their example. In a world that would send our hope to the grave, our, our hope in the resurrected one, and still tries to, we take courage and retain our hope in the resurrected one, continuing to draw near. Living in a world that would send its source of hope to the grave, so that it can continue to feel sorry for itself, we simply won't accept this. Our hope is not gone and cannot be quenched against all odds. First of all, we know that the Lord has sprung forth from the tomb. And the world has never been the same since. The reality of Christ's existence, death and resurrection cannot be disproven. It can only be disbelieved. For those who choose to believe, it means admitting that we're called to a new life. It means that we're called to a life of unconditional faith in Jesus, the resurrected one. So we might ask of ourselves, do I have an unconditional faith in the resurrected one? Or is my faith one of convenience? Am I willing to allow the reality of Christ's life and resurrection to shed light on all aspects of my life? Or do I hide my faith at all? Keeping my hope to myself. We are the people of the resurrection. And we live as those in the continuous day of the resurrection. You re may remember that teaching of the church that that Sunday of the resurrection is called the eighth day. The eighth day of life eternal. The eighth day of the revelation of the light that has no evening. The eighth day and the final day that is our inauguration into eternity. We're the people of the eighth day. Every Pascha, every Sunday, every day, as you know I love to say, the rising of the sun is a daily reminder of the resurrection. We are children of the light and of the day. The present continuous reality of the resurrection we bear with us always, always hopeful, even in the face of death, because death no longer has authority over us. And while Christ has begun the re recapitulation of humanity, we say, what's that very last line in the Nicene Creed? Do you know it? We look for the resurrection of the dead. And the life of the world to come. We look for the resurrection of the dead. And the life of the world to come. The eternal day of life. With Christ in God. And as for now. We see the resurrection imaged in. Even in creation. The rising of the sun. Cannot but remind us. Of the triumph of Christ over death. The dispelling of darkness. Every day is a resurrection. Every day is a rising from, 
from the tomb of our beds and from slumber. Every time we arise, we're participants in the resurrection. St. Nikolai of Zicha says, the, the Son of Righteousness has already risen from subterranean darkness at that early hour at which the myrrh bearers came to the body. As this sun shone before the sun was made at the first creation of the world, so it now at the second creation, at the renewal of the world, shone over human history. As I said, the world has never been the same since the incarnation of this man and especially his resurrection. This God-man, our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Joseph and the myrrh bearers, in hope against hope, hastened to, to honor the Lord as those hastening to the resurrection, as should we. We should live as those who are hastening to the resurrection, who are running toward life, who believe in life, that life reigns. One simple way of our living in the resurrection is our coming forth, proceeding together with the myrrh and spices of hope and love, approaching the place of our hope, hastening to the tomb, which is imaged by the holy altar. You ever notice that? The, the altar is an icon of the tomb, and the doors open remind us of the stone that's been rolled away from the tomb. During Sunday Orthros, we hear the proclamation of the resurrection every Sunday morning. We have a gospel reading proclaiming the resurrection. The readings are done from within the sanctuary. The sanctuary represents at times the eternal kingdom. But in this moment, it also represents the tomb from which shone forth the resurrected Lord. Whose glorified body we receive in Holy Communion. And what also happens after the proclamation of the resurrection, Christ bursts forth from the tomb, the priest, himself an icon of Christ, but also the gospel, an icon of the Logos, the Word of God, comes out and everyone draws near like the myrrh-bearing women to the tomb. And they venerate the gospel. They venerate the resurrected Lord. Orthros is actually pretty awesome if you give it a chance. Every time we find ourselves there, being made worthy to hear the Holy Gospel, we're standing at the door of the sepulcher, the stone having been rolled away. And we hear the miraculous announcement of the recapitulation of humanity that has once separated itself from God. Humanity, once subjected to hopelessness and corruption, has been regenerated, has been reborn. Unfortunately, the darkness of unbelief has not been altogether dispelled with the rising of the Son of Righteousness, our Lord Jesus, who has transformed a sepulcher into his royal chamber. We find ourselves challenged by hopelessness. And when we do, we must recall that by belief, we too become children of the light and of the day. We, have to, we choose, we choose to believe. We choose, despite our ignorance. We become children of the light and of the day of the eternal day of life in Christ, members of the eternal kingdom of God. Perhaps we'll find ourselves hoping even in the face of hopelessness. By doing so, we'll be imitating these beautiful and humble souls whom we remember today. The noble Joseph, along with Saint Nicodemus, and the apostles to the apostles, the myrrh-bearing women. So today we ask for their intercessions. We ask that through their intercessions, may Christ, our true God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen.